Well, okay, here we are. It has definitely been a while. I am so sorry that I have not been able to be on my platform for a very long time. But as you can tell by the title, I'm sure you can understand why. But now I am back and I am ready to share my story with you guys. Although this may be a difficult one, I will have some dark humor in here. This will be my coping mechanism, so please do not be triggered or um, you know, if you're sensitive to what I say or how I say it, please forgive me for that, but this is the way that I can share my story. So, everybody, welcome back. <laughs> if you're new here, my name is Sherelle, and today we're going to talk about how I am now diagnosed with cancer. So, my last vlog, you guys, I was at the beach, I had a great time with the family, and a week later... My husband said to me, um, after he was caressing my breast, he said, "Hun, your left breast feels very different. I know how it feels and it doesn't feel right to me. So I would like for you to go and have it looked at. And me being naive and I am really dismissive at times, sometimes I'm very hard headed as well. I would probably tell him, oh honey, it's nothing. You know, I've been working out, trying to get my pecs in order. And it could have just been something that I did not even care to recognize because I thought that I would be a healthy 33 year old, year old young female without any history of breast cancer. In this case, I thought that, you know, maybe he's right. I should go ahead and get it looked into. I am a mom, a daughter, a sister, a wife, and there are some important people here that would love to see me stick around. So in this case, I decided to go ahead and get it looked at. I made an appointment with my OBGYN, and at that appointment, she started to do her, self, her exam. She started with my neck area and was just feeling around for any abnormalities with my lymph nodes and things of that sort. She did tell me that my thyroid thyroid gland was enlarged and she asked me if I knew that. I said I didn't, you know, and I really wasn't concerned about that. But she did go ahead and refer me to get some blood work done and get an ultrasound just to be sure that it is nothing major. So she then persisted downwards and exam and did an exam on my breast, my right breast, no issues. And then she moved along to my left. And as she was feeling around, I noticed that she had a cause for concern. And I did tell her that I did feel my left breast a little, you know, very different as well. I said it was probably a very thick mass that was probably shaped or uh, the size of maybe a very, I don't know, um, you know, tennis or softball size mass. And I did not associate that with anything because my right breast kind of felt like that. It just kind of felt very thick. I thought maybe it would just be in relation to, you know, breastfeeding. I did have my son three years ago. Or it just could have been something that I did not recognize as anything different. Because when we associate breast cancer, you know, we try to go through what the guidelines suggest to us. If you have a inverted nipple or there's dimpling lumps. Uh, discharge, blood, things of that nature, probably pain, and I had none of those symptoms. I did not feel any pain in my left breast area. So for me, I did not associate that with anything other than, you know, just a regular, slightly enlarged left breast. So because she was concerned, she did go ahead and refer me to get a mammogram and an ultrasound. So during that appointment, or before that, uh, I did have an appointment to get my thyroid looked into. And the reason I'm bringing this up, I will, you, it will make sense a little later. During that appointment, I had my ultrasound done for my thyroid and it came back negative or inconclusive. Like there was nothing to be concerned with. I had blood work done just to see if I had hyperthyroidism uh, or um, hypo, nothing. So she, you know, I asked her what would be the, you know, med, you know, will I be medicated for this moving forward? Is there anything that we can do about it? And basically she told me, no, just keep an eye on it. If it's not restricting your air, uh, your airways or you know, if you're not having difficulty breathing or eating, I guess there was nothing to be done. I thought that was pretty weird. However, I just kind of said, okay, you know, doctors know the best, but they 
you know, we know how that goes sometimes. You always want to get a second opinion. Nonetheless, I had that done. And then a week later, I was actually scheduled to have my mammogram and ultrasound. So during the mammogram appointment, which was my first, I would like to say this. It is very difficult for a female of my age to get a mammogram. For some odd reason, they only want to entertain females that are of the age of 45 and up. And I find that very heartbreaking and um, concerning because when women want to take charge of their health, what do we do? We want to get a mammogram. And if you redirect us or tell us that this is not a necessary step for us to have a breast exam done, I really think it's an unfortunate situation and it, it uh, it's a deterrent and it needs to be fixed. Ran over. But I had to fight tooth and nail to get my mammogram and that's the reason why I brought it up. So my mammogram took place. Not bad procedure. A lot of, you know, very uh, heat pressure on the breast, different movements. It was not uncomfortable. It was un very uncomfortable, but it wasn't painful. So as she was doing, as the tech was taking the imaging images of the breast area, I too was curious and I looked behind the screen and I was trying to see if there was anything that I could point out to be abnormal and I didn't see anything. But the ultrasound would be the best confirmation to detect anything in the breast area. So my ultrasound was immediately right after my mammogram. The radiologist was the person who performed the ultrasound. And I was laying on the bed and I was really confident during this appointment because I, I did ask my OB during the time of my exam, you know, could this be a benign tumor? Do I have anything to worry about? And she said, there's a possibility that it could be benign and I kind of took that around with it. So at my ultrasound appointment, I sat there with my thoughts about it being benign and I was not really concerned. Now, as he scanned the right breast, there was nothing there and he moved on to the left. So he was actually spending uh, quite some time in one particular area and it really had me worried. And at that point, that is when I kind of got to the point of, okay, there's something that shouldn't be there. And he I also took images of my lymph nodes as well. So he set me up on the bed once he was done and he looked at me in my face eye to eye and said, there are three levels of concerns. There's low, medium, and high. And with you, I'm placing you in the high category and let me explain to you why. You see this here, there's some calcifications in your breast area in the upper and lower left quadrant, and then you have some in the lymph nodes area. So I am kind of concerned that this could possibly be a case of breast cancer. Okay. I'm numb at this point. I mean, I could hear the, the air, you know, the, I mean, everything in that room was squeaking to me because that's how silent it was. Uh, I had no words or anything to say, it had to register for us. I had to register that information for a quick second. And then I asked him too, I said, well, can calcifications be benign as well? You know, and he said there, you know, there's a chance that that could be, but the only way that we can determine that this is breast cancer or not is if I, if we get a biopsy done. So I'm going to go ahead and re refer you to Get a needle core biopsy on your on your left breast to include your lymph nodes. And I was like, oh, okay, so we're, we're here now. Mm -hmm. And I'm brave throughout this appointment. I mean, I had like the strength of a freaking, I don't know what to compare it to, but I mean, I, I really went in there with courage. However, that changed once he told me that I would be visiting and seeing a breast care nurse never heard of it before and he told me once we once you leave this appointment i would like for you to go down to the hallway to the left and there you will find mary and i was like okay so i'm shaking at this point if you ever had chills or being nervous anxiety that is kind of where i was at it was really bad at this point I left the room, I closed the door behind me, I walked down the hallway to the left, knocked on the door, and there was Mary. And Mary answered the door, and she invited me in her office and asked me to have a seat. And when I did, I immediately broke down crying. That was the first time that I cried. 
Mind you, I felt so alone because Anthony was not with me at this appointment. He was actually home with the children. My parents are in Georgia, friends. I'm an introvert. I mean, it was probably the loneliest walk I've ever had to make in my entire life. Not only that, I remember her saying specifically that I would love to give you a hug, but unfortunately due to COVID, I had no one to console me. And I do remember her saying this to me as well. She said, everyone that sees that comes to see me cries. And I'm like, yeah, we just been told we could be possibly diagnosed with breast cancer. What else we going to do, you know? <laughs> and I know what she meant. It wasn't anything against her, but it was definitely an eye opener. Um, but the breast care nurse is someone who is basically going to be attached to you during your care. She is your liaison, your semi point of contact. She will be there for your appointments, be available to you for any questions that you may have, support groups, all the above in regards to breast cancer. And that was a realization for me and it definitely took a very quick turn in my life to now understand and realize that this is something very serious. serious. So fast forward, I am now scheduled to be at my biopsy appointment. I am there, Mary was there, and I was so grateful for her to be there with me. Uh, she couldn't be in the procedure room with me. However, she was there in the waiting room as I was waiting to be escorted towards the back. Anthony was there as well. He's been with me since the beginning. However, due to COVID, I am pretty much alone during this process, unless you are a medical personnel that is authorized to be in that vicinity of care or whatnot. So, um, I was called to the back, I laid on the bed, the procedure was explained to me, and they told me they would take two samples from my left breast based on what the ultrasound confirmed to include some uh, samples from my lymph nodes because they seem to be positive as well. So. I would be honest with you, the procedure was not painful whatsoever and it was not uncomfortable. I didn't even notice that he did anything and, I, and it could possibly be because I have a very high uh, pain tolerance. However, nonetheless, it was simple, uh, in and out, probably took less than an hour at the most, but I would have to wait for my results after they were, um, you know, taken to the lab. So. Two days passed after the biopsy was performed and I was at the fabric store just shopping as usual with his eye and I received a phone call from a number that I don't recognize. I, I do. Okay. I recognize the number basically, but it wasn't a number that I was expecting to receive at that point in time. And I picked up the phone and it was the doctor, if you will, who took the biopsy sample. And he called me to let me know what my test results would be. If you ever heard Charlie Brown's teacher talk, blah, 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 blah. That's all I heard. And the only word that I heard in that entire conversation was, you have cancer. Okay. What type of cancer? You have invasive ductile carcinoma. Okay. Thank you very much. I knew he was not the person to ask those questions because he was pretty much reading a lab report letting me know what the results were. And at this point, I lost my appetite. I lost my appetite to shop, to eat, to think, to even be, exist, exist. I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to exist at that moment. I did not, I'll be quite honest with you. I felt so sick to my stomach. It was the heaviest, heaviest thing that could be on my chest at that moment. And so I put everything back. I took his eye with me. We walked back to the car. I put him in the car seat. I sat in my driver's seat and I cried so hard, so hard. And then I had to share the news with my mom because I knew she was waiting. So I called mom, called my dad, anybody that was important to me, my husband. I called all of them to let them know that this is indeed cancer. So now here's the hardest part, going home and sharing that with my children. And I did not want to let them know until it was confirmed. So once I got home, I mean, I was not in a great place or state of mind, but that very same day is a day that I had to explain to them what was going on. So I set everybody down. I had my mother on FaceTime just, for, just so she could, you know, be that comforting or be available to the kids. And 
I told them. The girls took it very hard. Brandon's my super trooper. He just kind of looked very dull. I, I know kids kind of register things differently, and I can't fault anybody for how they took that information. But Brandon, he was like, oh, okay, Mom. And I'm over here like, is there anything else you want to say? You know, but no, Brandon just gave me a hug and kind of went on about his day. The girls, of course, you know, were still crying. They were hugging me very tightly. And I can understand, you know, it's nothing but a mother's love. You want to be there for everything in regards to your children. Growing up throughout um, school and high school and marriage and children, you want to be there for all of those life events. Not just that, but you want to be there every single day until you know you're like 80 or 90 years old that's how long i wanted to live anyway so yeah it was very hard for them to digest that information and for anthony he's he, he's very uh he is taking this very well I'll be honest with you i have not witnessed him in a state of depression and it, you know he can do all that behind closed doors but i think for him he is really trying to be strong for me and um I can't fault him for that. He's doing everything that is required of him as a husband, as a friend, as a lover, uh, you know, as I go through this. And I'm grateful for that. Fast forward. We do now know what I have is in relation to cancer. So at this point, I have to meet my team, okay? And this is a round robin situation. That means that I will be meeting everybody that will be involved with my care. So it will start 0, 0730 in the morning to noon. And that is my window to meet everybody within a short time frame. So it was my nutritionist, my oncologist, my radiologist, my genealogist, my, genealogist, my um, behavioral health therapist, my surgeon. Anybody that had an is behind their name was there on that day. And it was exhausting. It was overwhelming. I was meeting people right after the other. And uh, I met my surgeon. And we talked and discussed my my plan of care. So during that time, I asked her, what does my prognosis look like? And um, she said to me, it looks good. I'm like, okay, we're off to a great start. That's what I want to hear. Um, and then I asked her about staging. And at that time, she really could not give me an answer because I haven't had a PET scan yet, nor an MRI. But she did do a feel and kind of measured how much of a, a, how big the tumor is in comparison to what she knows, you know, right off the top of her head. And she did feel my lymph nodes and she did not feel that they were clustered, but she couldn't be sure. The only way to actually get a real exact answer would be from a PET scan. But we did talk about what or how to remove the tumor. So based on the size that she was able to feel she suggested that i would probably have to get a mastectomy and i'm gonna tell you this right off the bat guys i'm 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 in this full force i'm available i'm a fighter i don't care what i have to go through physically and i mean that the only will that i have is to survive i don't care if my hair falls out my eyebrows have basically ran off the top of my forehead um, my eyelashes fell out, my nails fall off, whatever it is. I don't care. I don't care. I, my breasts mean nothing to me at this point. I'm angry with them, but they fed my kids, okay? I'm done having children. My husband, he don't need them. He can visualize, you know, the pasture rail. But in regards to my health, they need to go. And they are no longer called breasts okay I gave them a name they're called tumor tits okay <laughs> and I mean that I don't even take both of them shoot if I got a third one hiding somewhere take that one too but I don't want them I don't and I'm okay with that because she was only going to take the left breast I opted for a bilateral mastectomy take both of them I don't want to continue to look over my shoulders for the rest of my life now I will say this even though I'm getting a bilateral mastectomy it does not mean that reoccurrence cannot occur However, it does mean that the chances are a lot lower, probably within the three to five percent range. OK, so I'm giving myself an opportunity to have a leg in front of this so-called disease. So I'm OK with what the plan of action is. So as far as chemotherapy is concerned, I did meet with my oncologist the very same day and um, 
you know, a lot of things is fresh at this point. So they gave me options about how chemo would look. And there are three different types of uh, cancers that survive off of uh, hormones, if you will. So I will talk about two. I can't remember the third one, but there, well, there's three. So in some cases, people that are diagnosed with breast cancer will probably have a ERPR positive or negative receptor or HR2 negative and positive. I can't really talk about the HR2 too well, too much because I'm a little fresh in that area. I know what I have, but um, as far as the, the, uh, at the oh my gosh, the hormones, that is what the cancer feeds off of. So having the positive or negative hormone receptors pretty much dictates how the cancer is growing. Now, in this case, she actually thought I would be a triple negative, which means that I would be ERPR negative and HER2 negative. And that is normally thought to be common because of my age for one and the type of cancer that I have. So she was quite sure that I would probably have that and I had to prepare for that news, if you will. I did my homework and with triple negative breast cancer, is not so great because it will um, there aren't really hormone therapies that you can take after treatment is complete because the cancer is pretty much growing on its own without any assistance whatsoever so it can do and what it wants and it's very hard to treat um, but it can be treatable so don't get me wrong about that but it is very difficult it's probably more aggressive then the ERPR positive and HER2 negatives. Now that one um, means that the cancer is growing off of the estrogen and progesterone, but the HER2 is negative, um, is more tolerable in, in the sense of being treated, and um, you can take immuno, immunotherapy after uh, the chem uh, chemotherapy is done. So, um, so they discussed that with me and again this is all new i'm learning as i go mary is there of course she was there throughout my whole appointment and we took notes and anything that i did not understand she was very uh very keen on the information and she was able to relay that to me so that i can understand and i'm grateful for that because i'm over here like okay i know i'm trying to go to school to become a doctor but i'm not even there yet break this down for me so i can understand um so that was that that day has ended now it's time for me to get a pet scan that is probably the most intimidating thing that i ever had to go through it, especially if you're claustrophobic but it is a very long process and then you're laying there with the thought of what are they going to find so the unknowns are there and i am very afraid at this point because I know that I have cancer but the concern that I had was did it spread because I don't know how long I've had this and there's not really a good answer to define how long I've had it um, I did ask the oncologist that and he kind of gave me like a ballpark answer and it really has to do with age they, he said to me that people that are in their 50s will probably have cancer for a good one or two years before they even understand or find out that they have it but in younger generational uh, patients it tends to multiply a lot faster because you're young your cells grow a lot faster and it could have happened anywhere between you know six months to a year and that's kind of what I'm going off of because I do remember having a breast exam done a year prior to that but I, I can't remember so either way it's here, what's done is done, and I can't go back to the past and change anything. I can only focus on the now. So anyway, PET scan, breast MRI, both were done. I went, had to wait a week to get that answer, and when the, when the results came back, I found out that uh, the cancer in my breasts and my lymph nodes were indeed positive, and I also had some indicators in my neck. Okay, so we're going back to the thyroid situation. And I was like, okay, <laughs> now we're going back to the initial diagnosis of when I found out I was cancer. So that whole ordeal happened again when I found out that there could possibly be cancer in my neck area. And I was devastated. I, I mean, I broke down again. I was in the worst place ever. And I, would, I asked my surgeon, what does 
what does neck cancer look like? And she's like, you know, not good. I'm like, oh my God, take me now. I can handle this. <laughs> I can't handle it. And I really couldn't, to be honest with you. No, I, I was like, oh my God. So now I got to wait to find out if this is indeed true. And the way that the PET scan is uh, understood as far as how they can indicate cancer. And again, I'm no doctor. I'm just going off of what I've learned. And if I'm wrong, please correct me in the, in the, in the um, comment section. But the indicators for cancer during a PET scan um, is identified by a number system, one through 10, I believe, and five or more indicates that there is possible uh, cancer cells in the body. Anything less than that is probably just reactive. So I say that because the lymph nodes in my neck were about a two, two and a half. And then what was in my breast was around the range of five, probably no more than six or seven. Um, and I was like, okay, so I mean, okay, maybe this is just a reactive lymph node in my neck. And Mary knew that I was concerned. So she shared my concerns with the surgeon and the ENT because that is who I was getting ready to go see next in regards to my neck issue. And she wanted to get back with me as quickly as she could about is this possibly, I mean, could this possibly be neck cancer? And the surgeon and the ENT, you know, reviewed my imaging, my images and said, yeah, we don't think so, but we need to be sure. So let's go ahead and get this biopsy done. I went to my appointment. I remember sitting in that chair. I looked at him as he walked through the door and there were tears coming out of my eyes. I could not focus that day. I was in complete turmoil. I remember what he said to me specifically, and I really appreciate him for doing this. He walked up to me. He said, I've been doing this for a very long time, and I was reviewing your images. I know what neck cancer looks like. I don't think there is anything to be worried about today about that because I'm quite sure, but we're going to go ahead with this biopsy just to confirm. And when he said that to me, it was a sigh of relief. I, I was still up on the edge, but it was better than when I initially showed up for my appointment. So he numbed my neck, aspirated uh, two of my lymph nodes, and it took about 20 times for him to do it because they were the lymph nodes were very tiny, very small. And to me, it didn't hurt. I mean, I was taking this like a champ. He, was, he said, I'm very sorry that we had to continue to stick you, but it's okay if we do. I said, do what you got to do. Take what you need to take because I need to know today before I walk out this office if this is what, I, what it could be or if it's not. So proceed. And so he did. And I really appreciate the fact that they actually had a, I can't remember what, her, what, what they're called, but the, there was a lady there who was able to look at the samples with the doctor to both confirm at the very same time underneath the microscope if this could be cancerous. And they both looked nothing negative. And I, thank you, God. That's all I could say. Excuse me. Thank you guys, all I can say. And I walked out of there with the most, I, I mean, it, a weight just kind of took off, you know, it, had, it was gone. It, the weight on my shoulders was gone. Now I can only focus on the breasts. So that was past me. Uh, my thyroid did show up. I mean, it's still enlarged. The NT did look at that. And he also told me that we are not gonna concern ourselves with that right now. We will deal with that after you're done with treatment. And he said, normally uh, most people do have cysts in the neck and some lymph thyroid glands are enlarged and it's so uh, it's normal, but he really didn't tell me much. He didn't tell me if it could be, you know, Hashimoto's or hypo or hyperthyroidism. I guess I have to go back and get more blood work, more testing done in that area just to confirm anything. But for right now, in regards to his concern, he doesn't want to concern me or you know him or me with that issue and I'm okay with that because I already have enough to, to, to handle at this point. So now I know what my pet scans are. I know that I have breast cancer. Now let's talk about the staging. So my surgeon initially diagnosed me as a stage 2A, 2B, excuse me, a 2B uh, cancer patient 
but based on the PET scan, I have positive or involved lymph nodes that are in levels one, two, and three, three being, I guess, the worst um, or concerning. I, I don't know how they classify that, but either way, I guess, I guess level three is not good. And that upgraded my diagnosis to a 3B and that took me back again because I was so upset. I, at this point, I was taking the positives with the negatives. I was like, well, two is better than three and four. Um, the cancer hasn't spread, so that's good. The tumor in my lymph nodes is not as large as it is in my breast. You know, so I'm finding things so that I can cope with this. Um, but when I was upgraded, I was back to square one. I'm like, well, I guess three is better than four. You know, so I kind of lost motivation again. So I came home and I got on my knees and I put my prayer hands up and I gave this all to God. It was too much to bear. It was too heavy. I cannot handle this. I have to be brave and strong, not only for myself, but for my kids, but to also get through this treatment. I cannot sit here and cry every day and change anything that I cannot control except for what I can do now to better my chances at this. So no more, no more crying, live your life, be happy and continue doing what you're doing, Sherelle. That's it. And that's where I am today. So as far as chemotherapy is concerned, I was, uh, I started, mind you, my initial diagnosis was October 15th. Okay. Treatment wasn't going to start until November because of all the testing. So during this small window of opportunity, I am petrified because I'm thinking, okay, is the cancer is going to spread while we're sitting here thinking about what my treatment plan is. And rest assured, you know, the cancer is not that aggressive to where it's multiplying so, um, you know, so fast that it's just doing what it wants to do, you know, and wreaking havoc on my body. That's not the case. And I'm okay. I was like, okay. So November came around. I got scheduled to have my port placement and I did. And that was not a bad, I honestly, I actually enjoyed that procedure. Please don't judge me, but it was, I didn't feel anything. I guess I love medical science and I'm very involved in, um, medicine so for me i guess having that firsthand it's just i don't know i can't explain it guys i know it sounds weird but yes i really did enjoy that procedure um but you are semi alert um they do give you some you know lidocaine to numb the area but they also give you a light sed a sedative so you are partially awake because it needs you to be during that procedure but i trust me you should not feel anything and i did not um and that procedure probably took no more than an hour and a half. It was uh, in and out, you know, did it and I can go home the same day. So the port was done. I did feel kind of violated though because of how the port is accessed. And not only that, it's actually a catheter that goes through one of my uh, veins near my artery here um, so that the medicine can be administered. And that kind of had me on edge about, you know, I've never had a procedure in the hospital like that. I mean, I've been hospitalized maybe once due to a kidney infection, but no, nothing major in regards to surgery. I've been a very healthy, active female. So to me, this one was like a really gut puncher, but that was done. And so my chemotherapy treatment is, or was a combination of two. So the first treatment is called AC or neoadjuvant um, chemotherapy and it involves the red devil and I can't remember the other drug there is a lot of information <laughs> but the red devil and if you've been through chemotherapy before or you are a breast cancer survivor you all know what I'm talking about but it is one of the most potent chemotherapy drugs that is given or administered in the very beginning of treatment because it is trying to immediately kill cancer cells right off the bat and the side effects that go along with chemotherapy, you guys have probably heard horror stories. You've seen it on television. It's probably not a good tool to refer chemotherapy to, but I was not worried about any of that. I'm looking at, you know, I'm having a conversation with my oncologist and I'm like, when can I start? I'm anxious. I'm ready. Let's get going. I mean, I don't care. I'm telling you guys, 
I don't care what I'm going through. Give me what I need because I need to get over this hump in my life. I'm ready to start. And, you know, I'm sitting there talking to him and I want to go back in the chemo room so we can start today. That's how anxious I was. But that wasn't going to happen, you know. Blood work needs to be done and we need to make sure that the dosage that I'm receiving is accurate. Um, I'm also not going to have, I did not have surgery at the beginning, one, due to my hormone receptors, but two, because of the tumor size. So initially chemotherapy up front to shrink the tumor and try and kill the good and the bad cells, but that's what chemotherapy does. And I will have surgery when I'm done with chemo. That way uh, it, the procedure will be a little bit easier to uh, man, uh, manage um, and give me chances of having that tumor shrink so that there could possibly be clear margins, okay? So neoadjuvant up front, um, and the first day of chemotherapy, because this started November, the first week of November, um, I had my hair, uh, and I remember sitting in the chair, and again, this is all new to me, and I'm looking around the room, and um, it's a very comfortable room, to be honest with you. I mean, there was nothing to be afraid of. The nurses, the staff, rather, was very accommodating. And it's a very lovely room, very happy room. And I pick my favorite chair. I sit there every Tuesday. That is my chair next to the bathroom because <laughs> I have to go every 30 minutes uh, TMI. But yeah, so they hook, you know, the first day I did not have my port because it was scheduled the following Tuesday. And so the first IV was administered in the arm and um, not a weird sensation, you know, of course it was like, wow, you're getting ready to put those toxins in my body. Uh, and before I let him do that, I told my nurse, I said, give me a second. I have to say a prayer and I will say a prayer every time before this medication is administered to me. You would not stick me with anything until I say amen, not to be bossy, that's my protocol and he respected that and he was okay with it and I was done with my prayer and I said let's go and as he pumped me with that healing medicine because that's what I call it it was it was it was like okay here it goes you know I don't know how my body's gonna react I don't know what the couple what days or you know what the days are gonna look like after I'm done receiving my medication so all of those concerns was a, a real one so after he was done I'm just hooked up to the transfusion machine and I'm just comfortable I'm just browsing through my phone you know having a I'm having a comfortable time I can take a nap if I want to I can eat if I want to it is really a place of just being comfortable while you're getting medication and the whole ordeal took about three or four hours so I like to show up at 0 7 30 in the morning that is when the clinic opens I like to be the kind of the first ones there because if you um, there are uh, there are there's so many seats that can accommodate every patient and I don't want to wait an hour or two in the waiting room to receive treatment when I can be there bright and early when no one's there and be out as early as I can be because Anthony does have to go to work so I try to respect his time as well so that is how my regiment goes and I go home now during the AC treatment it was one dose every two weeks for two months and during that time frame, I, 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 uh, I, I'm going to say this, and I'm not tooting my horn, chemotherapy has no effect on me. And I, and I, and I say that in a very, very mild way because I, have, I did not suffer from fatigue or vomiting, um, no stomach aches, no cancer sores. I know I'm still in the middle of my treatment, but I'm going to get there. Um, probably the only thing that affected me was the fatigue and that's quite common because my white blood cells are being attacked at the same time and as well as my red blood count so that comes with the medication but I'm just sleepy so take days two three and four I'm just pretty much having a very sleepy day um, and I had to have shots administered, uh, which is the filgrotism. I hope I'm saying that right, which is supposed what is what is supposed to um, replenish my white my red my white blood cells. Okay, 
because I'm immunocompromised at this point. But other than that, I'm handling it very well. So AC was completed the last week of December. Moving on to the first week of January, phase two, Taxol. This is the new treatment that I'm on, which is more tolerable than the AC. And I did ask them what are the possible side effects for that drug. And they said they are very minimal. You will probably just you know, feel some muscle pain. Um, um, uh, neuropathy, which is like a tingling sensation in the fingers. Uh, and I can associate that with if you ever banged your elbow and you feel that electrical current going through your hand, it's in your fingertips and the tips of your toes. They said that is usually a common side effect with ta Taxol. And there's other things associated with that. But I'm here to let you know, I feel like they're giving me water. <laughs> Just to be honest with you, I am not affected by chemotherapy. And I thank God for that because I can't imagine being sick not being able to function, especially the kids seeing me in a worse state. The only thing that has affected me during chemotherapy is my hair. And some good places too, you know, and I can talk about that, but if you use your imagination, let's just say I don't have to shave anymore. <laughs> but, but my hair is gone. Um, my eyebrows are now uh, taking, a, taking a, a hike or, you know, it's going on a hiatus. And that's only because of tax off because my eyebrows were not affected during the AC treatment. So my eyelashes are barely hanging on. But I do notice that I have hair growth coming back and in places that I don't want them to be. Uh, I usually have, you know, a little bit of hair here. I'm not afraid to, or ashamed to say it, okay? I'm human. I don't care. But that, that has uh, appeared and then um, I do have some spikes growing out of my hair but it's not a complete regrowth it won't really truly happen until i'm done with chemotherapy but with taxol that is a 12-week treatment so january 1st until march 24th that is my timeline if all things go as well or go as planned i will be complete march 24th and that uh, i get my blood work done every day i make sure i keep up with that because that matters a lot when i'm getting treatment i have to be healthy because if i'm sick in any way i will have to skip treatment i can't afford that okay that will prolong my process now another scary thing is cancer and covid so i am very precautious during this uh, phase of my life uh, the kids and the family if I hear them sniffling, coughing, or their eyes look watery for whatever reason, back up, okay? Mama can't afford it, and so if I had to wear a mask in my house all day, Sherelle will wear a mask in the house all day, and they will as well. So, you know, the stakes are a lot higher when it comes to me. But I do still live my life. I still go grocery shopping. Um, I kind of know what days that is a good day for me, and that's pretty much towards the end or the day or two before my next session. So I go every Tuesday to the hospital. And I will say this, I'm very pleased with my team of care, my surgeon, I've heard nothing but great things about her as well as my oncologist, okay? Um, and that's a good thing and I feel very confident that I will see this through and I'm very positive about that. So after March 24th, I will have a month of recovery and that is just to replenish and make sure that my red and white blood cell count gets back up to normal and then I will have surgery thereafter. So the mastectomy will happen sometime in May and I did want to speak with a plastic surgeon because I surgeon because uh, breast reconstruction is a thing for me but I did have that consult last week. She didn't sell me. Matter of fact she pretty much ter gave me, uh, I was terrified after the conversation because uh, the way that this is going to have to go for me, once they remove the tumor, of course, it's going to remove a lot of the uh, muscle and fatty tissue inside the breast. And as far as the skin is concerned, there won't be much to utilize, if that makes sense. So there's a reconstruction that will allow them to take a flap from my back, twist it, and then bring it forward to make a structured breast or imitation of one. And if that is an, if that's not an option for me, because I can choose, they can take a flap from my belly region to include some muscle 
and then reconstruct the breast. And I looked at her, I'm like, no, you won't. No, no, I'm not going through all of this to have my breast removed for you to treat me like I'm just, I don't even know what to call it, but you're not going to pick and pick and all over my body and put something together. No, ma'am. Um, she also mentioned that she's going to have to put the skin and, uh, um, and, oh my gosh, skin, not enhancers, anyway, to uh, stretch the skin. She's going to have to put that behind my pe pectoral muscle, which is a little bit more painful than if she wasn't to, do, if she was to put it towards the front. Then she also mentioned that she'll have to remove a small rib and replace that with a cadaver bone. I'm like, ma'am, thank you for your time. This isn't happening. I'm good. I don't mind being flat chested, okay? I'm fine. I, and then, you know, with the breast implants, there's saline and there's another version called the gummy bears. So I've heard the gummy bears is probably a new thing on the market. It's not saline, it's silicone, but as far as puncture or anything that can damage the say a uh, silicone bag is probably very minimal but uh it won't it'll just coagulate in that area and it won't really go anywhere but what really did it for me is when she told me that this is a maintenance thing so every 10 15 or 20 years wherever i am on that timeline i would have to get them exchanged and then replace and i'm like wow is this what celebrities go through when they get breast implants and i said that's just too much i already have to go to the hospital every three months when i'm done with cancer i have to get seen every three months for a checkup talk about appointment fatigue like this is not over even though you think it's over because after surgery i would love to hear the words cancer free they don't really use that anymore they just say uh, no, the, no disease detected or whatnot because you know you're pretty much in remission. Cancer can come back, it can reoccur, and there's no definite time of when or how um, it can come back in the same place or it can actually go somewhere else in the body, which will make it stage four. And that's really my concern. I'm very afraid of that, but I really can't focus on that right now because it hasn't happened and. If it and I can only deal with it when it happens so right now I just need to focus on what I can do at the moment but yes reoccurrence is definitely something that I'm very fearful for but I learned that breast cancer medicine has evolved and has had so much research that that survivability is has increased a lot and tremendously and the drugs that are now being administered to these patients have have a better outcome for them. It's tolerable. There, you don't see buckets in the chemo room. People are not vomiting. They're not having bad reactions. And if they are, it's just very minimal. I mean, they may deal with it at home, but it has come a very long way. And I'm very grateful for that. And so I will also have radiation treatment as well. And that could range anywhere from six weeks uh, every day minus the weekend. So as you can tell, this is not a very easy road. I'm not in pain physically. I would say that is more so physical, uh, mental for me. I uh, do have a therapist. I do talk with this particular person on an uh, as, on an as need basis. But I think I'm handling it very well. I do go to support groups every Thursday. I meet with ladies who have been through breast cancer, some that have been in remission for one to three years and it's just very comforting to actually have someone to speak with because I really felt like I was the only one and I know this sounds silly guys but I was the only one on this island in the military community at the hospital that had breast cancer that's how I felt because I didn't hear anybody who else had that had experienced this and it was all new to me it was and then being at my age I'm like okay where did this come from? You know, the irony of spending seven years in the army, a 12 month rotation downrange Afghanistan to get out and come home and battle breast cancer. I'm like, wow, the war isn't over with. Sherelle, put your boots back on because you got another, you got another war to fight. And that to me just, just took me off the, you know, I was like, oh my goodness. So yeah, as you can understand, this is definitely a very, very hard process to deal with, but I am in a very good space, guys. I live my life. I'm happy. The kids do not see me at my lowest points. You know, I, I have my days where, I, uh, where I'm allowed to 
cry um but it's very minimal it took me a week to accept this saying the word cancer has not been easy making this video has not been easy it has taken me almost 25 tries to refilm this because it just wasn't coming out right and i needed time to digest this information so yeah here i am <laughs> sherelle who is diagnosed with stage 3b invasive ductar duct look at me ductile carcinoma erpr positive her2 negative that's me so i have cancer and life is not promised it's not it's probably it, this probably sounds bad because i know what i'm facing but if i was to walk out of my house anything can happen and i wouldn't know it god has a plan for all of us and whatever our day is that's our day i don't know what mine is and i can't think about that i can only live in the moment and just live life to the fullest and i'm very hopeful and optimistic that i will see this through um, I have very good hopes that I will be declared cancer free. And if I'm not, I'm okay, but we're not going to speak that into existence. We are going to say, Sherelle, you will be cancer free. So with that being said, ladies, please take charge of your health. Do not wait until it's too late. If you have suspicions, go see your healthcare provider and make sure that they do a very thorough job at examining your breast or any area on your body whether it be cervical colon uh, you know blood work that needs to be done to make sure that you don't have um, um, I can't remember the other cancer name but you know where I'm going with this take charge of your health and it's not just for the ladies fellas as well do what you need to do check the testes okay that's a real thing and you can get breast cancer as well don't be naive so do what you need to do make your appointments don't be in the predicament that I'm in. And if you do have cancer, please make sure you catch it early. So as far as my vlogs are concerned, I'm back. I'm going back to scheduling. I mean, you know, weekly vlogs as per, per usual. I have videos that I've pre-recorded since November. I have, um, so you guys will see that. And I will get you all up to date with my process and journey through my cancer treatment. Um, some videos are unfinished in, in the sense that I probably didn't pick it up the very next day, but I will find a way to kind of merge everything together so you all can kind of get a glimpse of everything that has transpired since then. And then we're going back to the now. It's February 8th or 9th, or the two, Wednesday after Super Bowl Sunday. I don't know, guys. But yeah, so I'm looking forward to getting back into vlogging and I will talk about, you know, my my cancer my diagnosis from time to time but i will not dwell on it um it's not something that i want to constantly remind myself of but we want positive vibes on this channel so if you're here to support me thank you so much and in the comment section please do not share any devastating news this will not help me whatsoever i need positivity i need hope and i need encouragement that is all that i ask and i ask that you respect that okay um i know some people have been affected negatively with cancer but that's not something i need to hear I'm not at that state of mind, and we don't need to discuss that. <laughs> so, so with that being said, there's a video. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and catching up with me, and I will see you all in the next video. Until then, 